Hello, hello, and welcome. Welcome once again to the Secrets of the High Demand Coach podcast. And I am here with Sean Longdo, who boasts over 25 years of immersion in the tech industry. Now, as the CEO of Outforce.ai, formerly Global Talent Accelerator, Sean's entrepreneurial journey continues to transform outsourcing from a daunting task to a strategic asset for venture-backed companies. The essence of Outforce.ai under Sean's leadership is to turn the outsourcing maze into a straight path toward accomplishing your mission. It's about fostering collaborations that hit the ground running, reducing the lead time from onboarding to actual project execution. Beyond his role at Outforce.ai, Sean continues to immerse himself in the startup ecosystem as a mentor, guiding new entrepreneurs and providing them with the resources and network they need to thrive. Well, Sean, so excited to have you here. Uh, very, very intrigued by this world of outsourcing. Uh, I've heard you say, and we'll jump into this here in a moment, that everyone's had a bad outsourcing experience. I've had a couple of those myself, but I don't think it has to be that way. So. Tell us a little bit about uh, uh, about this world of outsourcing. How did you get into uh, to founding out, Outforce.ai? It was actually the side of a desk while I was building another company, which was uh, Uber meets trucking um, and making sure nobody had an empty backhaul. And I was in a city of Calgary, which is kind of like Houston. It's an oil town, uh, generally resource-based economy. And the oil sector had, has, had gone down quite a bit, and they were trying to bring technology into the ecosystem. And I, uh, I saw that there were immigration issues in the United States, and Canada had a really good immigration policy for technical workers. So I started to bring U.S. H-1Bs into Canada and then contracting them back to the United States, just as a side of the desk thing. Um, and because of the exchange rate, that worked favorably for the people in the United States, and they didn't have to go back to Ukraine or wherever they were from. And, uh, and then people said, you know, my friends, CEOs in Canada said, uh, hey, you know, Sean, you're bringing all these engineers. Can you bring in some for me? And then I started, a, I said, well, I probably could. And so I started to build out a real a network of sourcers on the international level to bring people from all over the world, senior engineers only. And, uh, and that worked out really well. That was called Global Talent Accelerator. And the accelerator part was really, um, you had these very high qualified engineers technically but there was a cultural gap between North American work styles and uh, wherever they came from. And so we were accelerating the soft skills to enable them to work even better. Uh, so that worked all great until COVID happened and nobody came into Canada or anywhere. Everyone, all travel was suspended. And it made me think back. I mean, I built four tech companies. Every time I built a tech company, I'd hit an inflection point where I had to outsource something because I didn't have enough engineers and I needed a quick fix. And it was the opposite problem of, of uh, hiring engineers. There was just, you know, when you're hiring engineers, it's tough to find. They're all, all the good ones are already spoken for, so you got to pull them out. And what, when you look to outsourcing, it's easy to find. They're in your inbox 15 times a day. You're just hard to filter. So right. um, I just figured, you know what, it's about time that problem got solved. I mean, there is... You know, on the big enterprise level, there's all the big usual suspects, IBM, Deloitte, Capgemini. And then down on the very gig worker level, you know, for small, small projects, there's Upwork, Fiverr, Design99, whatever you want. But in the middle where you're really trying to get a bit of a team assembled, you know, three to five people at the least, there's nobody to filter all that noise in your inbox. So yeah. that's what I decided to do. Wow. Wow. So uh, as we mentioned in the the intro here, there's there's lots of opportunity to find really bad stories for outsourcing. Yes. Uh, there's there's, 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 there's plenty of them out there. I, I, you've had your share. I know I've had mine. Um, why? Why is that so common and does it have to be this way? You know, it's a really good question and there are many answers to it, but the fundamentals are grouped into three problems. One is nobody really has the time, right? You're building a company. Your people are solidly, you know, fully booked at what they're actually doing on their day job. And recruiters are good for hiring, but they're not necessarily good for hiring outsourced engineering firms. So you kind of lean more on your head of engineering, who's, you know, obviously focused on sprint to sprint and standups and, and their team, um, and, and may not be the best suited either at figuring out who's good. That's, that's number one. So you don't, you don't have time. Because you don't have time, 
you don't have a lot of data. You're Because you don't have time, you're going to take some shortcuts. You're going to go, hey, Scott, you know anybody who's good? And Scott, you may know somebody who's really good at scaling SaaS companies related to coaching or something like that. And I might be in health tech and I need something who, someone who knows the health industry and the you know, electronic records management and all the things that come with the health tech or fintech and banking laws and legislations. So you need somebody who understands your business, not just who understands your technology. Right. And and those people are are harder to find. So after hitting you, your friends, you sort of look around on the internet, try and pick a country that usually has good engineers, Brazil, Argentina, Ukraine, whatever. And there you're going to find literally thousands of companies. So again, you don't know where to choose. So you maybe get ad-based, um, um, you know, highly profiled companies, or they're really good at SEO. Either way, you end up talking to your, this is where the third part is process, right? So you have little time, you have really um, little data. So you, and in your process, you don't have a very good process. So in the process of interviewing engineering companies, you tend to start being the leader, wanting to talk to the leader of the engineering firm, and that's all they do all day. They answer those kinds of questions and they sound perfect for what you want to do. And so your expectations go way up. And then you find out the team that you they've they put us they've assigned to you because all their good engineers have been booked out, so they went and found out whoever they could find are not as good as the as uh, as advertised. And you had a huge level of disappointment. And that's where it starts. Then it gets worse from there. Sometimes it gets better, but that's how it happens. Wow. Uh, what do we do about it? How, how do you start to turn this around? I mean, it, it feels like a daunting task. What do you and your team do to help solve that? Uh, well, we start with lots of data. And I, I forget, forget about us. Uh, I'm about to publish a uh, the definitive guide of outsourcing. So giving away all the secret questions to ask, all the processes to do. But it still takes time, right? If you're going to do it right. So how we do it is we start with a massive database. We've tagged companies we, and we don't ask, like if you went to somebody and you said, let's say you had the health tech company and, uh, and you, you'd go, hey, we're, we're doing um, records management for a bunch of hospitals. You guys do records management and health tech. Oh yeah, we do that. They're, they're all going to say yes. And then the problem is you never meet the engineers until the very end when they're actually in your sprint or on your onboarding process. So we do a reverse, we go from the bottom up. We, we actually look at what engineers are available from the firm that we know is tagged, good, that they're good at health tech and they know they're good at electronic records. So that, that's, that's part of the process. And, and what we've done to sort of fast track that process is introduced a whole bunch of automations to get the information from those uh, agencies about who's available, what their, what their, uh, what their resumes are like, done some interviewing on what their communication skills are like, done some diligence on on what their culture is like. You know, it's, it's churn rate in the company. You've got a big churn rate. You could start off with a great pile of engineers, but they can't keep them. What the hell? You're training people every second month. It's no fire. So those kinds of things. Got it. Good, good, good. So let's say we've we've done the work, we've brought somebody in. Um, when and how should you start assessing whether or not it's working, right? Whether or not you've got the right fit or that they're going to be able to help you achieve that mission that you're going after? Excellent question. I guess bef you, I'll answer that question in a second. But first, you have to go back and figure out whether you're ready for outsourcing. Not everybody is ready. You know, you need to have either, and, and, and that doesn't mean you've got a project totally scoped out and you're ready to go with the details because guaranteed the project's going to change scope. It's really, do you have the um, an enablement to bring them into your company? So some of the best organizations I've seen have brought in two or three engineers to join a pod and really understand how they work better. And they may have hired three or four more and they're in different pods or they're going to bring these three once they're once they've experienced the company, and the the rest of the four are going to join those later, and they'll create their own pod. Um, but just how how are you going to onboard? What readiness do you have? How are you going to manage them? Is there somebody on point in your company, or are you expecting them to just throw over, shit over the fence and hope it comes back exactly as you told them? So that's that's number one. Um, and then to your point, how do you know whether it's working or not? Well, we recommend 
throwing some stuff over the fence that they should know if they're good and they're good at what you know, right? So we recommend throwing them some technical debt for the first couple of sprints. You know, everybody's got technical debt. And so get them, you know, it's a low risk and could fix something that could be a major problem without risking anything on the future. And that's a really great way. So you get a couple of sprints of technical debt and then you know how these people work and whether they're going to work out for you. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, that's a great, great uh, concept. Uh, everyone has technical debt. I'm still stuck on that. Uh, yes. Uh, so um, I want to jump in here uh, on something that I, I picked up through the thread of, of several of your comments, and, and that is this idea of culture and you know, different nationalities, culture, uh, different companies, culture. What role uh, does comp does culture play in outsourcing? Because I've seen several folks who have thought, hey, they don't have to match our culture. That's why we outsource. What would you say to that? Oh my gosh. No, absolutely not. I mean, uh, it has to be aligned because that's where the communications fall apart, right? Like if you are a, a you know, continuous improvement case development company that is just ramping in speed, 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 uh, everything's happening on a daily basis, you cannot work with a company that is used to waterfall clients, right? And that is used to project-oriented work. They may be experts in domain. They may be deep in the tech stack. But boy, if they don't fit your work culture, forget about it. So those kinds of things are really, really important. And then you talk about nationalities or different areas of the world. I mean, outsourcing could be, outsourcing does not mean, people think outsourcing, they think India, all right? First thing they think, oh, low cost labor India. Well, guess what? Some of the brightest people, 50% of the CTOs of Silicon Valley are from India. So don't think, uh, <laughs> there aren't a lot of companies looking to India to pull the best engineers out of there. Um, their IITs, their uh, institutions are, you know, equal to, if not better than Stanford, Harvard for, for or MIT for engineering. So, uh, so co big companies sign off $250,000 checks for people from India. It is not therefore low cost. Good engineers around the world are, 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 are known good engineers and they will be priced accordingly. Um, but going to the back. India or Southeast Asia generally is a higher culture. So just by the nature of the education system, it's one where you really don't challenge, the, you don't challenge the teacher, you don't question authority. Those, those kinds of things flow into their culture of work where, you know, you're in a sprint and you've got this, you got some, uh, you got a, a, a story that you're trying to, an epic you're trying to, you're trying to play into, uh, you're trying to build out and you know, the person might know more about the product than the rest of the team, but might not say anything from a culture of hierarchy yeah. um, and or might not understand what's really going on and not question, not ask because fear of making mistakes. So that kind of thing can happen in, in certain cultures. And then the opposite side of the culture, you know, some, uh, I don't want to, I mean, I'll just say some East European countries tend to be fairly demonstrative and you get somebody who comes in and says, Nobody near is knowing what they're doing. I'm the only one, and away we go. <laughs> and they just crap all over everybody. So it it kills you. They're they're super strong engineers, but they're acid on your team dynamics. Right, it's corrosive. So those kinds of things have to be considered. Yeah. So one of the thing a, a number of my clients wouldn't consider themselves tech companies but increasingly they're relying on technology for their needs and uh they they might be in you know doing an internal system for technology needs or whatever it might be how should non-tech companies think about outsourcing their uh, their technology needs carefully <laughs> yeah again match is really important and uh so as an example, like, like I said, we have 80,000 companies in our database tagged based on what they're really good at. And sometimes there's, you know, they're good at four or five things. Sometimes they're good at only one. And so some companies are really good at proof of concepts. So if you've got an idea and you're just starting your first company, you don't want to give a, you know, 30% of the company to an engineer buddy who might not be the right engineer, you know, a few years later when you're scaling. Um, a uh, safe way to do it is to get make sure you got product market fit and have somebody build the proof of concept. Um, if you've got more sort of just integration problems, there are tons of companies that do that, and there's a, tons of tons of applications that can do that for you. You know, Zapier obviously one of the biggest API uh, companies in the world. So there's technical ways of getting around that. 
but you need someone who's a little more architecturally oriented that might helpful. And so fractional use of a CTO might be a really good use of outsourcing. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a question I like to ask all my guests, and it is this. What is the biggest secret you wish wasn't a secret at all? What's that one thing that you wish every uh, entrepreneur leader uh, out there listening or watching today knew? Wow. Wow. Uh, that's, that is a phenomenal question, Scott. I love that question. I would say, and this is true of everything, that state of mind is the biggest differentiator in everything we do. And if you bring a great state of mind to work, to relationships, to athleticism, whatever, you will perform at a much higher level. And coaching, which is the space that you're in, is one of the best ways to augment state of mind. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Uh, so uh, um, there's some folks listening to this and it, like you've described every problem and you've described how they've responded there's to no every problem, problem. right? <laughs> uh, they're just like, how does he know all of this? Uh, and yeah. and they're, they're thinking, hey, this guy really understands his stuff. We need some help. We haven't had success doing it ourselves. Where can they find more out about you and, and Outforce.ai? Well, thanks for the plug. That's uh, Outforce.ai is the place. And we, we actually have a... Uh, uh, a database, uh, an example of our database up on this, up on the site as well, so you can play around and see what matches your criteria. Um, it's redacted until we engage with you, but uh, but it's there. And uh, yeah, like I said, connect through uh, Sean at Outforce.ai, and I would or LinkedIn. It's L A N. I don't know if you put my name up on the on the show notes, but L A N G U E D O C. Terribly French name and an S E N E. S E A N for Sean um, uh, at uh, on LinkedIn. Either way, connect with me, refer to the show, and uh, and I'd be happy to send you the that uh, definitive guide, which should be ready in about a month, and uh, and help you along in any way you want. I, I'm I'm always happy to help entrepreneurs in any way I can. And my co the whole reason I built this company, by the way, Scott, is because I wasted so much time in these outsourcing things, like sometimes it was a failed failed relationship, sometimes um, with uh, just slow and not satisfactory, but we push through. And I just don't want anyone to waste any time talking to companies that are a waste of time. Yeah. Wow. Couldn't end on a better note. Sean, thank you so much uh, for everything that you share today, for the work that you do. It's really important and it's very impactful. I highly recommend uh, if you're even thinking about thinking about outsourcing, uh, it's a brilliant resource uh, for you to save an enormous amount of time. So go check it out. And for those of you who are watching, listening, you know your time and attention mean the world to us. I hope you got as much out of this conversation as I know I did. And I cannot wait to see you next time. Take care.